guest and keynote speaker, Professor Mohan De Silva, is the chairman of the University Grants Commission of Sri Lanka, as was mentioned. He was also the senior professor of surgery and chair in surgery at the Faculty of Medical Sciences, University of Sri Jayawadnapura, Sri Lanka, and a consultant surgeon at the Colombo South Teaching Hospital, a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh and of the Asia Pacific Society of Digestive Endoscopy, as well as a Master of Surgery of the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine of the University of Colombo, Professor De Silva has also served as President of the College of Surgeons of Sri Lanka, Dean of the Medical Faculty of Medic I beg your pardon, Dean of the Faculty of Medical Sciences at the University of Sri Jayawadnapur of Colombo, and as an advisor on patient safety to WHO Southeast Asia Regional Office. Professor De Silva's distinguished surgical career needs no introduction, but it has also seen him introduce innovation instrumental in advancing the field and reducing patient debts. He's also the first Sri Lankan surgeon practicing in Sri Lanka to publish a single author surgical textbook in the UK. But perhaps even more relevant to today, he is currently a member of the National Education Commission, the National Human Resource Council of Sri Lanka, and represents Sri Lanka in the US-UK Fulbright Commission. In the field of higher education, he has led the introduction of many new sustainable systems to enhance transparency, accountability, and quality assurance. So please welcome Professor Mohan De Silva. Very good morning to all of you. Thank you, Madam, for your kind introduction. Thank you, Lakshman, for inviting me to this very distinguished conference. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, quality education is the magnet for nation building. Universities and higher education institutes have a vital role, therefore, to play, to produce valued human resources for this purpose. Since 1947, Sri Lankans have been blessed with a policy of free education, including higher education, and later free health care. These visionary reforms have brought many firsts in South Asia to our country. Excellent male and female literacy rates, life expectancy rates, and health care indices, to name few. In the context of higher education, Whilst many countries in the region have evolved in line with global trends, Sri Lanka lagged behind. With the necessary reforms in the field of higher education sector, the sector that is responsible for creating human resources to accelerate the country's knowledge economy. In this presentation, therefore, I wish to touch upon briefly some reasons why we lag behind when compared with our neighbors, and also what higher education policy formulators like us have already proposed to the policy makers in this country for the progress of higher education. That is in nutshell what I'm going to talk about. First, why we lag behind our neighbors. On the 16th of October 2019, that's a couple of weeks ago, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of CWW Kanangara, considered by many as the father of free education. This legendary personality was fighting with our colonial masters 72 years ago to obtain opportunities to voiceless rural youngsters entry into education. The nation is ever so grateful to him. And this was Sri Lanka 72 years ago. The world has changed. Change, of course, is inevitable. But it's the rate of change that matters. The cry for free education and higher education that emanated 72 years ago, that has continued up to this date, has environmentalized as a right of our people. 
and as a secondary outcome, may have inhibited the progress of non-state higher education compared to other countries in the region. Therefore, the rate of change that was witnessed in the, South, in the Asian subcontinent responding to ever-increasing demand for higher education was not witnessed in Sri Lanka. We clearly lag behind. Let's now look at the progress of state-sponsored free higher education in our country. University Grants Commission was established by an act in the parliament in 1978. And this act has been amended six times. Let's first look at the good side. Successive governments spend money for free higher education. Contrary to popular belief, student enrollments have increased. For example, the total number of seats available in mid-1970s was 3,500. Today, in 2019, it is over 31,000 to 15 state universities only. In addition, there are four other state universities that comes under the Ministry of Higher Education, Ministry of Defense, and also under the Ministry of Technology and Skills Development. There are also other 38 technical colleges and eight university colleges offering certificate courses, diplomas, and higher diplomas, and also degrees. All in all, once a child completes his or her O-level or A-level, excluding the university sector, there are at least 185,731 placements in all these sectors. I repeat, 185,731 placements in all these sectors. If you add 31,000 degrees from the university, UGC-controlled universities, that is state universities, it comes to a grand total of 216,231 placements, all free. Approximately 250,000 sit for GCA level. And compare these figures with free educational opportunities available in the regional and also in the developed countries. Let's look at the infrastructure, facilities, and how it developed, including hostel facilities to state university system. This has been increased progressively, contrary to what you hear frequently during the student protest on roads. For example, during the last five years, in those that comes under the purview of the University Grants Commission, an extra 100 hostels have opened up, each with facilities to house 400 students. In general, universities charge a very nominal fee, ranging from 700 rupees to 1,200 rupees per year as hostel fees. Today, most of the peripheral located universities provide hostel facilities for entire four years. And all universities, the state universities, provide hostel facilities for first years and the final years. Let's next analyze the student financial welfare systems. The marvelous scholarship scheme came in due to the vision of another great personality, late Mr. Lalit Atulat Mudali. Today, 50% of students benefit 5,000 rupees a month, to be very precise, 5,050 rupees a month during their entire university period, 50%. In addition, another 16% of students get student bursaries, that is 4,000 rupees per month. This means that around 66% of admissions every year gets financial support, either 5,000, 5,050 5, or 4,000. These are not loans. They need not pay back. Let's now look at the progress of STEM education in Sri Lanka. Opportunities for STEM education have substantially increased. During the last five years, a total of 29 technology degree programs, including 12 new technology faculties have opened up in the state universities. And for the first time in the history of post-colonial Sri Lanka, two medical faculties were opened up in one year increasing the available medical seats by 160. 
University of Moratua will have another medical faculty in addition to these two, ready to accept students, an extra 60 to 75 medical seats will be made available for 2012-2020 intake, which is the next intake. Of course, more opportunities obviously need to be created to respond to the ever-increasing demand, the thirst for quality higher education. All I have presented is what is available. Sounds good. Let me now present the other side of the coin. How much of these facilities have been used to address the needs of the country, to contribute to knowledge economy, subject I'm entrusted to address? Let me be more objective now. University Grants Commission conducted a trace study on graduate employability in 2017. The objective of this study was to find out the employability status of our graduates two years after graduation. This slide tells you all. This slide shows objective evidence that what we produce does not tally with the skills the employees seek. As you can see, 50% of graduates in humanities and social sciences today coming from state universities are unemployed at two years from graduation. University Grants Commission has tried, to, tried hard to address this issue, the skills mismatch. To have a major curricular revision in humanities and social sciences to suit the present day needs. I chair the standing committee for humanities and social sciences. I was a Herculean task, I must say. I'm happy to mention that the, under the World Bank project, the new World Bank project called AHEAD project, we offered a competitive block grant to humanities and social sciences faculties to the tune of 100 million rupees per proposal. I repeat the figure. 100 million rupees per proposal for this purpose. I'm happy to report to you that eight humanities and social sciences faculties have won this grant. They will commence major revisions, including the introduction of social emotional skills and internships, and most importantly, commencement of bilingual education. Also during the last five years, almost, e, almost all ELTUs English language teaching units, which traditional universities had, were upgraded by gasset notifications to English language teaching departments. And now they have started working with a new vigor. Just getting out of my script, I want to tell you something. The working English is vital for practice in our country. In this very detailed tracer study we undertook, we saw something very interesting. We looked at the, we had from the cohort of students we studied who had passed out two years ago, we looked at their O-level English result and the A-level English result. And then we looked at what happened to these people. Interesting point emerged, and that is, if a child has obtained A in English for advanced level, irrespective of the subject discipline, 88% were employed at the end of two years. If they've had an A level A in English, irrespective of the discipline they entered into in the university, 88% were found employed. So I think we are very happy that English language teaching departments this is a spoken English, written English, and comprehension, that component, not the linguistics we are referring to. And they have started working with a new vigor. Next, do we have a safe and conducive learning environment in our state universities like in other countries? We have all heard about an organized, organized form of physical, emotional, and sexual abuse 
that goes on in state universities under the disguise of ragging. What have you done to address this menace? First, we wanted to understand the magnitude of this problem for which we conducted a scientific study. University Grants Commission and the Ministry of Higher Education together, supported by UNICEF, who provided us not only the funding but also their research expertise. The title of this study was Study on Ragging and Sexual and Gender-Based Violence in the State University System and Implementing Interventions and Mechanisms to Combat Ragging and Sexual and Gender-Based Violence in the Sri Lankan State University System. This study involved a cohort of nearly 15,000 students, 1,500 staff, vice chancellors, other university staff, council members, and the study group conducted a 94 focus group discussion. This was a partly a qualitative and partly a quantitative study. These discussions were held with stakeholders to understand the magnitude and the impact, the root causes, and to plan combat strategies. As a result of a major media campaign by the University Grants Commission and the Ministry of Higher Education, ably supported by some vice chancellors, the society has now understood the magnitude and the scale of this uh, magnitude and the scale of this problem. Scale of this physical, psychological, and sexual violence in our state universities. That has been in existence for over two decades, but hidden from all. Now it is on the surface. We cannot work like ostrich, putting our head on, our, on, on the sand. Now that is well on the surface. Everyone is against. They have all joined this fight. The staff, the vice chancellors, the students, the parents, the media, and now the latest is, is uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association who has written to all presidential aspirants put an end to this menace which is engulfed the Sri Lankan state university system. What measures have you taken to ensure quality education in institutions under the purview of the University Grants Commission? A new quality assurance process was introduced in 2015 to all state universities with a scorecard for the first time to assess the quality of the institution and the quality of the programs and classify universities and degree programs as very good, good, satisfactory, or unsatisfactory. Results have been published in the web for the consumption of students and parents. This has not gone well with some, but it was a necessity of the times. At policy level, a national quality assurance and accreditation bill has been gasseted to cover and to accredit all academic distinctions to be awarded within the shores of Sri Lanka. Such a label from a national quality assurance and accreditation by an independent third party will provide a seal of approval for all academic programs, state, non-state or foreign, offered within the shores of Sri Lanka acceptable and respected by all locally, regionally, and globally. It will also enhance the quality and transparency of the process, and therefore the respect for such accredit accredited programs. This is a global view regarding quality assurance and accreditation today. Many countries in our region are actively engaged in the competition, and as we are all aware, the accreditation is often used to project an institution to those who may wish to gain a degree from that organization with confidence. Issues arise when it comes to professional degree programs. The specific issue, to put it very precisely and to some extent quite bluntly, that the professional organizations that are empowered by acts or ordinances feel threatened that another authority is transgressing 
their power and authority. Some professional bodies are empowered to accredit degrees in their disciplines. The basis behind such approach has been that professional organizations are run by professionals of the discipline and that they have the expertise of the profession. This is understandable and justifiable. There are many such professional organizations, I think include, including your esteemed organizations. As the higher education evolved globally and transparency, accountability, and good governance became norms, the need to display the transparency, accountability, and principles of good governance was extended to all bodies, including professional bodies. It is expected that all such organizations are run with openness, transparency, and accountability based on the principles of good governance. A national quality assurance and accreditation system that oversees all accreditation processes in higher education will not interfere with the integrity, power, and respect of such professional organizations, but instead would enhance the credibility of the professional degree or a diploma locally, regionally, and globally. This is a view of the INCOHE, the International Network of Quality Assurance Agencies in Higher Education, one of the largest global networks of quality assurance in the world, who conducted a biennial conference in Sri Lanka. We won that with a competition against China, Chile, and Vietnam. And it was the same view of the Asia Pacific Group, that is called APQ and Asia Pacific Quality Network. Again, who had the, their global conference in Sri Lanka as back-to-back -back conferences in Kohe. The basis behind the concept is to provide the legal framework to solidify the expectation that all professional accreditation agencies shall display the transparency and principles of good governance and refrain themselves from ownership and protectionism issues. It is therefore important that such national quality assurance and accreditation system, when established, is independent and represented by experts with unblemished professional records from different disciplines and devoid of political and any other influences. Such a commission will not interfere with the integrity and the power of professional organizations established under any other acts, but would act as a watchdog like the National Audit Act of 2018. The political interference of such positions must be removed, which in fact got into this bill as well at the time of submission. This must be removed at the parliament and at the committee level. University Grants Commission has made the strongest representation to all the high policymakers on this subject. Once such issues are removed, and we are confident that it will happen, we hope that this will be a historic bill for the progress of state and non-state higher education in this island. Finally, the University Grants Commission strongly feel that the present funding system to state universities is clearly not sustainable. Universities continue, continually request funds for buildings and other infrastructure facilities and produce products who may not fit to the society and to the market needs, as you saw a few minutes ago. Of course, universities argue that they are not the employment factories and portray themselves as knowledge creators and knowledge givers. This justification may be philosophically right in 19th and 20th century when Oxford and Cambridge were developed away from London because of the belief that the noise from this busy town may disturb the intelligent high academics so that they can't think. In the present day context, however, society expects universities to produce able graduates. And of course, able graduates must be employable. In a competitive society in which we live today, universities too must be ready for competition, for progress. And with the present University Act and UGC regulations, which I had, universities are hampered from entering this competition. Therefore, 
University Grants Commission strongly feel that universities must be provided with more autonomy. The academic and non-academic staff should be given special category status with a performance-based pay structure and performance appraisal system, and they must be made accountable for what they do. Funding from the government should be based on student numbers and the performance of the university. The performance must be assessed on a set of performance indicators. Student satisfaction surveys regarding the quality of teaching and learning activities, external quality assurance reviews, as I mentioned before, research and development activities, IP activities, and presence of safe and conducive learning environments for students must be linked to funding. The faculty should be given greater autonomy to initiate supplementary academic activities, including income generating projects, and allow to function as strategic business units. Universities should be empowered to recruit international students on a fee living basis. Concept paper to this effect has already been submitted to the government by the University Grants Commission with necessary details. I just gave you a glimpse of it. And unless we move away from the conventional funding system, Sri Lankan higher education system, in our opinion, is doomed to fail if we continue to hang on to the popular jargon such as 6% of the GDP without specific reforms. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I've tried to be honest with you and told you where we were, where we are now, what we have done, and what needs to be done to create a knowledge economy for nation building. Thank you.